Christmas and welcome to the movies. How many of you guys have seen Polar Express? Yeah, a whole lot of you. Well, it is the story about a boy who's trying to decide if he still believes in Santa Claus. And then on Christmas Eve night, the Polar Express, this magical train, comes barreling through his neighborhood and takes him on a wild adventure that will restore his belief in Christmas magic and Santa Claus. Now, obviously, this is not a Christian movie, and it's about belief in Santa Claus, not belief in the real Christmas story, but there's some really good concepts about belief that this movie raises. So let me ask you a question. What do you believe about the real Christmas story? I'm not talking about Santa Claus and reindeer. I'm talking about the God of the universe coming to earth, born of a virgin, born in Bethlehem, living a perfect life, dying a substitutionary death on the cross so that you can be forgiven of your sin, and then rising on the third day. What do you believe about that Christmas story? And some of you may be a little surprised to learn that the Christmas story actually didn't start on Christmas night, that first Christmas night in Bethlehem. It actually started at the very beginning of creation. The entire Bible, from Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation, is the Christmas story. It is telling one story of who Jesus is. Listen to how Sally Lloyd-Jones says this in the Jesus Storybook Bible for Kids. Here's what she says. Now, some people think the Bible is a book of rules, telling you what you should and shouldn't do. The Bible does have some rules in it. They show you how life works best. But the Bible isn't mainly about you and what you should be doing. It's about God and what he has done. Other people think the Bible is a book of heroes, showing you people you should copy. The Bible does have some heroes in it, but most of the people in the Bible really aren't heroes at all. They make some big mistakes, sometimes on purpose. They get afraid and run away. At times, they're downright mean. No, the Bible isn't a book of rules or a book of heroes. The Bible is most of all a story. It's an adventure story about a young hero who comes from a faraway country to win back his lost treasure. It's a love story about a brave prince who leaves his palace, his throne, everything to rescue the ones he loves. It's like the most wonderful of fairy tales that has actually come true in real life. You see, the best thing about this story is it's true. There are lots of stories in the Bible, but all of those stories are telling one big story, the story of how God loves his children and comes to rescue them. And at the very center of this story, there is a baby. Every story in the Bible whispers his name. He's like the missing piece in a puzzle, the piece that makes all the other pieces fit together. And suddenly, you see this beautiful picture. This is no ordinary baby. This is the child on which everything would depend. On that first Christmas night, Jesus became Emmanuel, God with us. He was born in Bethlehem, born of a virgin. He lived a perfect life died on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins. It's a story that can change everything. But what's so amazing is this child upon whom everything would depend that would change the course of history, that story started so quietly with no fanfare. There were no royal invitations, no royal trumpets blaring, just some uh, angels singing to shepherds in the field and scaring them to death. But what happened on this Christmas night transform the world. And it can also change your eternity if you believe. It was the coming of the Messiah who came to save us from our sins. And here's the amazing thing about this story. It isn't over. Jesus promises that he will return again. And when he comes again, he will come to take us home to live with him. That's the Christmas story. And it's so much more than a fairy tale about one magical night in Bethlehem. It's true. So let me ask you again, what do you believe about the Christmas story? Is it just a story or is it real? As real as the story of George Washington becoming the first president of the United States. What do you believe about the Christmas story? For some of you guys, if you're honest, what I just read from the children's storybook Bible, if you're honest, you you have a hard time grappling with that, wrapping your brain around the idea of the God of the universe who made everything suddenly deciding to come to earth and being born as a baby of a virgin and uh, angels talking to sheep and all those different things. It feels a little like a Christmas children's story to you. It's beautiful, but it seems a little hard to fathom. Our hero in the Polar Express, he is, has a similar uh, struggle with belief in Santa Claus. Check out this next clip.
Seeing is believing. Am I right? So what can we actually know about this Christmas story? The real Christmas story was told in most detail by a guy named Luke in the book of Luke in the New Testament of the Bible. Luke was a physician. He was also a historian. And he writes this account in about 60 AD. So only about 28 years after Jesus died and rose from the dead. Now, there's a couple of things that are important. First of all, he wasn't Jewish, which probably makes him the only non-Jewish writer of any part of the New Testament. But because he's a scientist, he has a very scientific way of approaching all of this. There's a methodology about it. He gives us lots of things that explain to us what we can understand, but he also gives us historical perspective that we can go verify in other sources, like who the governor was at the time, who the Roman emperor was, so that those things can be verified after uh, you read his account. Listen to the very beginning of Luke's historical account in the book of Luke as he explains his methodology and what he's doing. This is Luke 1, 1 through 4. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. So Luke says he is writing it to a guy named Theophilus. We don't know who Theophilus was, but he was probably either a noble noble birth or he was a government official of some kind because Luke calls him most excellent, so there's some deference there to his position. But Luke explains that he has done an investigation into the details of the Christmas story, the story of Jesus, and that he is giving that to Theophilus so that he can know the truth of what he has been taught. But it's not just for Theophilus. He is writing it for us as well so that we can understand what we are told and we can see the evidence of this Christmas story, of who Jesus is, that he is who he claimed to be, and he's done what he claims to have done. The story was written using eyewitness accounts. Luke goes and he interviews actual eyewitnesses to the events that occurred with Jesus, including some of Jesus' closest followers. He doesn't write this hundreds of years later when everybody had died. He writes it while those eyewitnesses are still alive. And, And it makes you wonder, why put that kind of effort? Why did he go to all that effort to investigate this event? Because it's true. And if Luke's account isn't enough for you, there are 43 different historical sources that either discuss or mention Jesus. 43. That's a lot. Now get this. The Roman emperor at the time of Jesus is a guy named Tiberius Caesar. So he is the king. He's the emperor. He's the most important person in the entire known world. There are only 10 ancient sources that mention Tiberius Caesar. So you got to ask yourself, why is it that almost four and a half times more historical sources mention this carpenter from kind of the edge of the Roman Empire in Israel. Why do they mention him so much more than the king of the empire? Now, if you're thinking, well, all of those sources that talk about Jesus are Christian sources, you'd actually be wrong about that. There are actually 10 non-Christian sources that either mention or discuss Jesus. If you compare that to the non-Christian sources that mention Tiberius Caesar, Tiberius Caesar is still mentioned in less non-Christian sources than Jesus is. See, even though there are less writings about Tiberius Caesar, we don't have any question that he is who history says he was, that he was the emperor at the time Jesus was born. There's an incredible amount of historical evidence that the Christmas story is real, that Jesus is who he claims to be, and he's done what he claims to have done, that this story is so much more than legend or fairy tale that it actually happened. But look, it it still requires belief. It it requires a step of faith because we can't actually see it for ourselves. We can't go back in time and see Jesus being born. We can't see Jesus's ministry. We have to rely on things that tell us what happened. And, And so ultimately, we have to have faith in things that we can't see and we can't touch. Check out this next clip where Uh, this hero of the story is trying to deal with things that he can't see. Maybe the thing that separates the Christmas story from other historical events that we read about and don't question is the miracles. 
That's maybe something that's different. And you're thinking, yeah, well, when I read about Tiberius Caesar, it's not talking about, you know, angels appearing to shepherds in the field and all these miracles and somebody coming back from the dead. So let me ask you, have you ever seen a miracle? A few of you raise your hand, but let me push back on you. How many of you have looked in a mirror? Who's looked in a mirror? You have seen a miracle. You are a walking miracle talking miracle because you are a creation of God. Let me explain that. There's all these amazing details about the human body that I could talk about, but I'm just going to focus in on DNA. DNA is the computer programming, basically. It is the programming inside of us that makes us who we are. Look at this genetic code picture. This is DNA. It's got that cool double helix structure. It was actually discovered by two guys named Francis Crick and James Washington. Uh, Watson back in 1953. After they discovered it, Mr. Crick goes into a local pub and he says, I've discovered the secret of life. What he actually discovered was God's genetic code for life. He discovered what makes us who we are. It's programmed into every single cell in our body. Here's how amazing DNA is. All of the electronic information in the entire world, every computer system, all the government computer system, everything you can think about can be stored on less than one ounce of human DNA. It is made up of billions of different little sequences that are perfectly aligned to create this genetic code that make us who we are. They say that if you could take this DNA in one person and you could unfold it and lay it end to end, it would stretch out for 67 billion miles. Now, to put that into a little perspective, that's a trip to the sun and back 150,000 times. That's how amazing this DNA is and the crazy complexity. Bill Gates, the founder of Microsoft, he was asked about the comparison between DNA code and computer code. And keep in mind, he knows a little something about computer code. And he says this, DNA is like a computer program, but far far more advanced than anything we've ever created. Bill Gates, he knows about computer software. And when we see a computer program, do we think it just happened? Of course not. We know that somebody created and made it because it is complex. DNA shows the miracle of creation. So if you're trying to decide, okay, but maybe all that happened by chance, maybe it's just evolution and over time, uh, it just all happened randomly. You've got to ask yourself this question. What is the mathematical probability that that DNA could align to make a human being? What's the odds of that happening? Well, Francis Crick, one of the guys that discovered DNA, he did some math to come up with whether or not just one simple protein sequence, just one of the many thousands of things that make up who we are, could align through evolution by chance. And here's what he came up with. He said the odds of that happening is 1 in 10 to the 260,000th power. That's a one with 260 zeros behind it. That's not even a number we have a name for. That's how big it is. Mathematicians tell us that anything over one in 10 to the 15th power is a statistical impossibility. And the probability of one single protein sequence being created by chance is trillions of times less likely than a statistical impossibility. So let's take it one step further. What are the odds that an entire DNA alignment could happen so that an entire human being could be created purely by chance through evolution? Well, a scientist named Fred Hoyle, he wrote a book called Evolution from Space. And what he does is he goes through and he figures out what the statistical probability is of all of this DNA aligning up to make a human being by random chance. And he says it's 1 in 10 to the 40,000th power. A 1 with 40,000 zeros after it. Remember, 1 in 10 to the 15th power is a t- statistical impossibility. And it's drum- I mean, crazy beyond that. He says the odds of that happening by chance are the same as someone looking for a single specific grain of sand on every beach in the entire universe and finding it on the first try. It just can't happen. Now, here's the funny thing about Fred Hull. Fred Hoyle is an atheist, so he doesn't believe that an all-powerful God created everything and created us. And so he's got to come up with an explanation because he's now found that it's a statistical impossibility for it to have happened by chance. And so if you're not going to believe in God, he came up with the next, I guess, most likely thing. 
Space, space aliens. That, that's what he came up with. He decided that since life couldn't have happened on earth without involvement, he decided that it was, life on earth was started by super intelligent, powerful space aliens. Now, don't laugh too much because this actually has a name. It's called panspermia, and it's the idea that the basic building blocks of life came from aliens in space. Now, you may already be sitting there thinking about the problem that I realized with his theory that space aliens created humans. Who created the space aliens, right? I mean, that's a basic problem. We were not created by intelligent aliens. We were made by an all-powerful God. That's a miracle. So if we experience the miracle of life every single day, every time we look in the mirror, why shouldn't we accept the miracle of Christmas is true. There's tons of evidence supporting that God created us and that Jesus lived, died on the cross, and rose from the dead. Why shouldn't we believe that? Look, I get some of you going, well, you can't see it. But, but there are lots of things we can't see that we absolutely believe in. You can't see gravity or radio waves or oxygen or ultraviolet light. But we don't question whether those things exist. And some of you are going to push back and go, but Nathan, we, can, we can't see them but we can see the evidence, the impact of them. I would say the exact same thing is true for God. We are the evidence of God. We are the thing that you can see and touch that is made and created by the unseen. We're incredibly complex. When you see a watch lying on the ground, you look down there and go, oh, that watch just appeared there. It, it uh, grew up, must have grown out of the grass by chance. Of course not. It is a complex machine. You look down and you say, someone designed and made that watch. We're way more complex than a watch is. So why do we assume that we happened by chance? When you travel to Mount Rushmore and you see all those faces carved into the rock, do you go, well, that's probably just a coincidence of you know, random patterns of wind and rain over time? Of course not. You know that someone created it because it's a complex creation. And then we look at history to tell us who carved it. The exact same thing is true about the Christmas story. There is incredible evidence of God, and then history gives us incredible evidence that the creator God came to earth on that first Christmas. How about this that ought to be enough for you? The calendar that we use every single day is based on the life of a carpenter from Israel. What is the odds of that happening unless he lived a life that changed history because he is exactly who he claims to be? The evidence of his life and his death and his resurrection are real. But sometimes you have to ultimately make a decision to look at all the evidence and then make a step of faith because you can't see it for yourself. You can't go back in time. There's no video evidence that you can look to because video didn't exist. And you have to step out in faith and believe in something that you can't see. But sometimes the unseen is the most real thing of all. Listen to how the Apostle Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 4.18. He says, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. The unseen is the most important thing. But we have to step out in faith. That's what it requires. That's part of this Christmas story becoming a part of who we are. For us, not just hearing the Christmas story, but adopting it for ourselves. Listen to how the writer of Hebrews says this in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. It requires a step of faith. In the Polar Express, we kind of see this play out. Our hero has ridden this magical train. He's gone to the North Pole. He's seen Santa's workshop. He's talked to elves. He's seen this entire mountain of toys for the good boys and girls. He's even caught a glimpse of Santa Claus. But he's still struggling with belief despite all of that evidence. And in the movie, if you don't believe in Santa Claus, you can't hear the sleigh bells on Santa's sleigh. Check out this next clip. Our hero is standing with elves singing around him, looking at Santa's sleigh and catches a glimpse of Santa Claus. And yet, even though he sees all of that evidence, he still has to make a decision to believe. And the same thing is true for us. 
We can miss the miracle of creation. We can miss the amazement of the night sky that we can't even begin to fathom or understand. We can miss the amazing creation of who we can are. We are. We can miss the miracle of Christmas. You can go through this whole life choosing to ignore the evidence. Or you can choose to step out in faith and believe that this story is more than a story. It's more than fiction and that it can change your life forever. For those of us who believe, we have this unique perspective on Christmas. We look at it through a different lens because for Christians, we are living in between the already and the not yet. Jesus has already come to earth. He will come again. So we are living in this amazing time between when Jesus came to earth the first time and when he will return to take us home in heaven. We're living in between the already and the not yet. If you have young kids, you know exactly what I'm talking about because your kids are right now living in between the already and the not yet. The presents are already under the tree, but it's not yet time to open them. And and so at night, they may get down around the tree and they may find their present and they may stare so hard at their present that maybe, just maybe, they'll get x-ray vision and can see what's inside. Maybe when you're not looking, they do a little shaking of the presents to try to figure it out. If you've got really young kids, they may have asked you this morning, Mom, is it Christmas? Is it time for us to open the presents? And you had to say, not yet. We're not quite there yet. And they're like, yeah, but the presents, they're right there. They're living in between the already and the not yet. That's the amazing place we are. One of my favorite Christmas memories is from about 22 years ago. My oldest, Ashley, was five. And the year before, on Christmas Eve night, She could not go to sleep, and then she woke up like every 30 minutes out throughout the night. We finally let her get up at 4.30 in the morning to open presents and see what Santa had brought, and we were miserably tired all day long. And so the next year, we were going to fix this. And so we, we put her in bed with me, and we said, okay, you cannot get up until after 6 a.m. And so we put this big red digital clock with the big numbers, you remember those? where she could see exactly what time it was. It took her forever to go to sleep, and it seemed like I might just close my eyes and fall asleep, and I heard, Dad, Dad, yeah, honey, it's time, it's after six, it's time to get up and open presents. And I rolled over and I said, honey, what time is it? And she said, Dad, she looked at the clock and she said, it's six oh oh. She had been living in between the already and then not yet for hours. She knew Santa had probably already come, but it wasn't yet time to get up and open the presents. She was living in between the already and the not yet. Ultimately, what you choose to believe about this Christmas story defines how you experience Christmas, and it can ultimately define your eternity. Jesus came to earth on that first Christmas, but he will come again. But it will be different. The first time he came... He came in weakness. When he returns, it will be in power and strength. When he comes back, he came as, when he came the first time, he came as a servant. When he comes again, it'll be as a conqueror. The first time he came, he came as a baby in a manger. When he returns, he will return as a mighty king. The first time he came to earth, he came to die on the cross. When he returns, he'll come to bring the death back to life. The first time on that first Christmas when he arrived, It was very quiet, just some angels singing in a field. When he returns, it will be with a roar. The Bible says that all of heaven will be peeled back like a scroll. Every person will bow down on one knee and proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord. But I have to think that that experience when they say that will be very different for people who believed in Jesus and those who didn't. For those of us who believe, we'll say those words with victory and celebration. But for the people who missed out on the Christmas story and didn't follow Jesus, I can only believe they'll say those words with sadness and regret. What you choose to believe about this Christmas story can literally change your heaven. Do you believe that the God of the universe left his throne in heaven, was born as a baby, and then died like a man on the cross so that you could be forgiven? How you respond to what Jesus did for you will define your eternity. It's the most impactful and powerful story ever told. Here's how the Polar Express ends. Check this out.
Let me leave you with this final question. This Christmas, do you hear the bells? Let's pray.